Not know tonight, part two of our investigation into the murder of Joyce Thomas. We're taking a closer look at how the FBI, state police, and local police departments all work together to trace her killer's steps, solve the case, and bring her family closure. Our Victor George shares details about the tools used by officers to plot a timeline of those dark days. Police use technology, perseverance, and even luck when initially identifying who DeWoody was. Right after Joyce went missing, we showed you images of a man with a silver car that was caught on camera at her apartment complex. Many believed he was the last person to see Joyce. Philip DeWoody's day began around 9 in the morning. His bank statements and receipts showing he made purchases that would be used to cover up the murder even before he had met up with Joyce later that day. He had three gallon size bottles of Clorox bleach. Do you remember that? Do you remember going to the Walmart Opelousas that morning? Uh, oh, yeah, I do. February 26, 2020, the day Joyce Thomas went missing. Initially, he told investigators he last saw Joyce when he dropped her off at the Ville Platte Walmart and he went to Lafayette. But license plate readers along Ambassador Caffrey and surveillance video pool did not support his story. He then told a new story when he was brought in for questioning again. Joyce didn't get dropped off like I told you at the beginning at the Walmart. She was with me pretty much that whole afternoon. He claimed she actually got into a SUV with some men who were going to take her to a casino and he never saw her again. Another lie. Investigators told him then exactly how they knew his story wasn't the truth, using digital fingerprints he left behind, as well as video surveillance. And then he went to Chevron in Bill Platt. He got some gas after that. That was exactly 10.23 a.m. The Woody would then go pick up Joyce and went back to the gas station to buy snacks, and there were receipts to prove it. Police then visited every home or business between Grand Coteau and Sunset on I-49. They talked to people, collected video, and recreated the path of the Woody's car. At 11.32 a.m., you're at I-49 at Harry Gilbo. And that's, uh, you're, you're, uh, y'all are picking up on surveillance right there. Phone records show around 12.30, the Woody's phone would call Joyce Thomas's bank. And shortly after, her family started receiving ransom calls. The cell phone data also shows both his and her phone were together. Then at 2.30, two eyewitnesses tell police they saw the Woody at an abandoned house on the Sunset Service Road and heard a woman whose voice was muffled. Just a half hour later, receipts and video showed the Woody at the Karen Crow Walmart, buying new clothes before heading to a car wash. But you do understand that you're being charged with first degree murder. I know you, do, you say you don't understand how, but you understand that you are being charged. Because you're not going to find nothing to connect you to A few months later, the Woody would confess. He said he wanted to avoid the death penalty. Then she started trying to go back to the car and I grabbed her by the arm. And, uh, held her. She started jerking away from me then. It, everything just from that point on there, I just got scared and pulled a knife out and said. The Woody would then pour bleach on her body and throw out all the evidence. He would later draw a map for police to find the evidence, including a knife he had thrown in a drainage ditch. Earlier this year, the Woody pleaded guilty to first degree murder in Joyce's death. The judge handed down three life sentences. Both the Woody and his attorney waived his right to appeal the conviction and sentences, which means the case is closed. I'm in the tech center, Victor Georges, KTC TV3.